If you have your Bibles this morning, I would encourage you to turn with me to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. And we're going to read verse 14. Psalm 139, 14. And as always, I would ask if you're able to stand for the reading of God's Word that you would do so. As we read this one verse from Psalm 139. The psalmist writes in verse 14, I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. The psalmist celebrates that he has been crafted by God. He has been fashioned by the Lord Almighty, the Creator of of the universe and everything in it, and that his body, his being, has been formed intentionally, beautifully, wonderfully, fearfully, by the Lord God himself. I will praise you, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We're going to talk a little bit this morning about our bodies. Our bodies. Father God, thank you for today and the opportunity again that we have to be here. Lord, I pray that as we now open your word, Lord, that we not only open your word, but we open our ears and we open our hearts. That we might hear what you have to say to us through the proclamation of your living word. God, that you would speak to all of us, myself included, to hear the message that you have for us today. And God, may we receive it, may we embrace it, and may we apply it to our lives that we might go out of here different than we came in. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. As you're being seated, you can turn back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Where we started last week, we will finish the chapter this morning. Last Sunday, we moved through verses 1 through 11 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And just a quick reminder, in these first 11 verses, we read that Paul strongly discouraged these Corinthians and by extension, Christians everywhere from filing lawsuits against one another, especially against fellow believers. He also, as you may recall in the latter part of these first 11 verses, broadly identified several different examples of unfaithful behaviors and sinful lifestyles. Now it appears that the litigation that Paul was dealing with in the first 11 verses of this chapter stemmed from the division among the congregation that he had elaborated on extensively in the first four chapters of this book. So in other words, last week's message seemed to be a natural outcropping of a previous topic. From division to lawsuits as a result. We see this same type of thing throughout Paul's letter to the Corinthians. We see it again today. You may recall another issue that Paul has previously dealt with in chapter 5 was a specific instance in which there was a member of the Corinthian church, a man who was engaged in a sexually immoral relationship with his father's wife. Now, before your head explodes, remember we said that probably does not mean his biological mother. Although in the world today, and even in this time, I guess crazier things have happened. Likely it was his stepmother. It was another of his father's wives. But nevertheless... If you remember from chapter 5, this behavior was not only known by the church, it was...
was being celebrated by the church. They were boasting about this egregiously sinful behavior going on in the midst of the church. And the bulk of chapter 5 was not so much about this man and the sin he was committing, but rather it was about the church and their response to it. Or you might say their lack of response to address it. But as we move into the latter part of chapter 6, we once again see Paul going back and elaborating more on a previously discussed topic. You see, he dealt with the church's behavior, but he never really explicitly dealt with the sin of sexual immorality itself. That's what we find here in the latter part of chapter 6. An extension of a previously mentioned idea. We see this throughout Paul's letter. It helps us to identify and follow his train of thought, if you will, as he was writing the letter and see how it all fits together. And so I've titled the message this morning, How to Use Your Body. How to use your body. Verses 12 through 20 of chapter 6 deals explicitly with the issue of sexual immorality. And so the question is, how should we use our body? We'll seek to answer that question this morning. First point there on the outline is called made to last. Made to last. Let's pick up where we left off last Sunday in verse 12. Paul writes, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. But God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. Now God has not only raised the Lord but will also raise us up through his power. Jesus lived a perfect, righteous, sin-free life. The Bible tells us that he who knew no sin became sin for us. Jesus did not sin. He accomplished something that none of us could ever even hope to accomplish. By the time that we're, I don't know, 5, 10, 15 years old, we've committed gazillions of sins. And it just keeps on going. But Jesus never sinned. And in so doing, he perfectly kept the rigorous requirements of the law. Something that would be a, a, a hopeless cause for any of us. And he went on to establish a new covenant through his shed blood on the cross of Calvary. As a result, Christians no longer live under the law. We do not live under the rigor of the old covenant, but rather we are covered by the blood of Christ and we live in light of the new covenant of God's grace. Praise the Lord. We as believers are not saved on the basis of our works. But rather, we are saved on the basis of His completed work. When Jesus died on the cross and said, It is finished, that wasn't a cry of defeat, it was a cry of victory. He had come a accomplished and completed the work for which God had sent him. He had attained and purchased our souls, redeeming us from our sin through his work. And in him we as believers are set free from the requirements of the law. Praise the Lord. But that being said, 
it begs a question. Does our freedom entitle us then to sin without impunity? Can we, since we have been set free from the law, do whatever we want, continue to engage in sinful conduct because it doesn't matter anymore we're under grace? In other words, how should Christians view and properly exercise their religious liberty? Well, beloved, Paul will delve into this subject, the topic of religious liberty, much deeper later in this letter. He'll come back around to it again. And we will see him go into it into uh, much depth in chapters 8 and chapters 9 when we get there in a few weeks. But for now, he simply mentions it here in this one verse, stating that, verse 12, just because I can do something doesn't necessarily mean that I should. Just because it is lawful doesn't necessarily mean that it is beneficial. Doesn't mean that it's good for me. Doesn't mean that it's edifying for my body. Just because I can is not an excuse for doing something that's going to be hurtful or harmful. Not only that, it says that just because I can do something, I don't want anything to gain mastery over me. In other words, some of the things that we would engage in will wield a negative influence in our lives. And they can get their hooks in us, and they can become strongholds in our life that gain mastery over us. They can become addictions. They can become unbreakable habits. Paul says, I don't want to engage in these types of conduct, nor should you. Just avoid them. And he gives an example. He says, food satisfies the hum hunger of the stomach. And on the converse, the stomach necessitates the eating of food. They, they go together. And yet, he says, both will pass away. Now, in a similar but contrasting way, the physical body has its own hungers. The physical body has its own desires. Just like the stomach wants food or carnal flesh, wants to be gratified. Our carnal flesh wants physical indulgence. Our carnal flesh desires behaviors that would be sexually immoral. And he says, well, the food may be for the stomach, but listen, the body is not for sexual immorality. It's not. The body is for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. That is the proper comparison. You guys have got it all out of whack. <laughs> the body is not to indulge in sexually immoral or immoral behavior to gratify itself and to gratify the lust of the flesh. And then he goes on to even add another point in these verses saying in verse 15 that God has not only raised up the Lord Jesus Christ bodily, physically from the grave, but so also he will raise us up by his power at some point. Beloved, these bodies are not disposable. These bodies are not dispensable. These bodies are not simply just going to pass away 
and rot and turn into dust and be forgotten about forever? No. Because when Jesus comes again, these bodies will be raised. These bodies will be reconstituted, glorified, yes, made imperishable, yes, made incorruptible, yes, but still us. When the Bible says that we will have new bodies, it means that our bodies will be made new, but they will still be our bodies. They'll be better. <laughs> Thank goodness. They won't hurt. They won't get old. They won't need naps on Father's Day. They're going to be good, but they're still going to be our bodies. We're not going to be sprouting wings and flying around like angels. We're not going to be angels. We're going to be human beings. We are human beings. And we will dwell with Christ if we know him as Lord and Savior bodily, soul and body, forever and ever in the physical presence of Jesus Christ. These bodies have been fashioned for eternity. They're made to last. And we should treat them with due respect. Well, let's look at the second point this morning. We are in verse 15. The second point is called members of Christ. Paul poses a few questions. It's a common tactic if you haven't noticed throughout his writing. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself with a prostitute is one body with her? For he says the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Beloved, here, later in this letter, and elsewhere in Paul's writings and elsewhere throughout Scripture, we find the beautiful truth that when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and personal Savior, when we become a believer, we become a member of his body. A member of his body. Again, Paul will dwell on this issue in length when we get to chapter 12. You see all these little interconnections of this letter, of these topics being mentioned, explained later, and so forth, back and forth. But here in this particular passage, as the primary theme is sexual immorality, here he at least mentions and introduces the concept by stating that born-again believers are bound to Christ. We are joined to him. As Christians, we are wholly connected to the Lord, both body and spirit. The Bible describes this union in various ways, in various places. But let me give you one of the more familiar that you're probably aware of in John chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. Let's talk about this union. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch in me that bears fruit, he prunes, so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you, so abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. 
He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. He is the vine. We are the branches. We are connected to him. The same nutrients that flow through the vine flow into the branches. We are grafted in. We are bound to him. We are to abide in him just as he abides in us. We are members of Christ. That being the truth. Heaven forbid. Heaven forbid that a saved person would defile their bodies by giving it over to a prostitute. Now, it uses the example of prostitution here, but let's think even broader than that. By giving it over in adultery, by giving it over in an in affair, by giving it over to, to anyone uh, through extramarital or premarital sex, whatever the case may be, how in the world would we, as members of the body of Christ, give ourselves over to become members of a prostitute? Beloved, hear me. According to the divine living word of God, there is no such thing as casual or meaningless sex. It does not exist. Listen. There are emotional, psychological, spiritual, and countless other aspects of sexual engagement and expression that go far beyond just a physical act. According to scripture, when God created a man and a woman way back in the beginning, he says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined with his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Now beloved, in the most literal sense, that is talking about sexual intercourse, which could and in many cases results in the birth of a child. And so quite literally, the two have become one flesh. The child shares characteristics from both the parents. The child shares DNA from both the parents. But the meaning goes beyond just that. There's a lot more to becoming one flesh than simply physical intimacy. A husband and a wife become one in an innumerable number of ways. They begin to finish each other's sentences. They begin to like the same foods. They begin to have the same ideas about how they should maybe spend their money, share common purposes and ideals. They begin to think alike and talk alike. And Janice, I'm sorry, but even sometimes look alike. Beloved, well, that's how God designed it. That's the way God meant it to be. That's why, listen to me, that's why sex is to be reserved for a marriage relationship. It's God's intention that a man and a woman come together and become one flesh, literally, and 
figuratively. It's God's design. That being God's plan. Christians should not be binding their bodies and becoming one flesh in God's sight, even in a physical sense, with anyone other than their spouse. Do not become one flesh with a prostitute. Because listen to me, when you have sex with someone in God's eyes, whether you think about it or not, you have become one flesh with them. And heaven forbid that we do that with anyone other than the spouse that God has for us. Believers should be giving their bodies to the Lord. They should be uniting spiritually with Him. And by the way, the spiritual connection with God is even greater than the connection we have with our spouse. In short, we should be members of Christ, not members of a prostitute. Well, let's look at the last few verses of this chapter. The last point is called, not your own. Not your own. We're in verse 18. Flee immorality. Let me say that again. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. But the immoral man sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Paul instructs the Corinthian believers, and by extension all believers, you and me today, and believers in every generation, flee from sexual immorality. Listen, don't toy with it. Don't linger on it. Don't mull it around in your mind. Run! Listen, the charms of sexual immorality will trip you up. They will trip you up, and we are instructed not to be enticed by them, to run. The Corinthians, as I've mentioned earlier in the series, lived in a city that was filled with sexual conduct. I already mentioned the, the Roman temple that was there to, to the goddess Aphrodite, the goddess of sex, fertility. I've already mentioned that the city was replete with prostitution and harlotry and all sorts of sexual sin. In fact, some of the early non-biblical writers in this era simply referred to prostitutes as Corinthians. <laughs> wow. I would add to that, in the midst of this culture, you have a burgeoning church, which is a first generation church. What am I saying? Everybody in the church was a new Christian. There weren't senior members of the church that you could go to for counsel. There weren't grandpas and grandmas that you could look up to who have been faithful for decades and decades and decades that you could run to and say, oh, help me on that. What would you do? How do you? They weren't there. All of these people were new Christians who had grown up in the culture of sex and promiscuity, and it was just rampant everywhere. And I'm sure many of them had practiced it and engaged in it. Some of them obviously still were. I would like to think that we've grown past that, but America looks a lot like Rome. He said, listen, 
You need to come out of that. You Corinthian Christians need to come out of that. And you need to be different. You need to look different than the culture around you. You need to be distinct. I'm not saying you need to be perfect. I'm saying you need to be different. He was calling them to change, to flee from sexual immorality, and he explained that unlike most sins, sexual immorality is a sin against one's own body. Amen. Now, there are others. He says here that every other sin, and that's kind of how I part really, because there are other sins against the body. Let me give you an example, gluttony. What well, is a sin against the body, but I, I will tell you there are things I eat that I shouldn't eat. Putting anything in your body that is going to make you high, it's going to make you inebriated, that's going to be damaging to your body in some way, and all of us do it, it's a sin against our body. Hurting yourself. We live in a culture where people cut themselves. They did it back in this time. It's a sin against your body. We talk about suicide, but that's a sin against your body. But the pinnacle, perhaps the most uh, prominent of them, as we see here, is sexual immorality. Because not only does it hurt your body physically, it defiles your body. It disrupts the purity of your body. And not only does it do that, beloved, but it invites debilitating disease. Now, I don't need to get overly graphic here. But there are lots of diseases that people can catch when they are just engaged in sex with multiple partners all over the place. All over. We have it right here in Seymour. <laughs> and as, ugh, as it is to think about such things, can I tell you, these diseases are from God. And they're judgments against people for defiling their bodies. Not only does it defile your body, and not only is it a sin against your own body, but Paul also goes on to recall a metaphor and repeat a metaphor that he had used previously in the letter back in chapter 3, when he said that we are the temple of God. He comes back to that idea here in this passage, saying, remember that your bodies are the temple of God. Beloved, when we as Christians accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, Scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Godhead, God's Spirit comes to dwell within our bodies. He takes up residence within us as Christians. Can I ask you a question? Would you like living in a dirty house? Would you like living in a filthy, disgusting house? I wouldn't. Do you think it was would be right or justified to expect the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, to dwell in a defiled, impure That's not reasonable. Well, beloved, our body's the temple. And so what then is the implication? We need to keep our bodies clean. We need to keep our bodies in order. 
to the extent possible. We need to keep them pure and holy. You know, the Bible calls us to holiness. Scripture says, be holy as I am holy. Listen, short of heaven, we, we're never going to be holy. But God still calls us to that standard. It's something that we should aspire to, even if we can't get there yet. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and therefore we should not dirty them with sexually immoral behavior or any other type of sin. Finally, Paul explained that Jesus died on the cross not only to save the souls of sinners, hear me, but also to redeem their bodies. See, we overlook this all the time. God died to save my soul, yes, and our body as well. He paid the price on Calvary to forgive and restore all of mankind both spiritually and physically. As such, these bodies belong to Him. He purchased them at Calvary. They have been bought with a price. Do you not know that you are not your own, for you have been bought with the price? These bodies belong to the Lord. He died to redeem us bodily and soul. Therefore, glorify God with your bodies. In other words, bring glory to God. In and through and with your body. How should we use our body? We should use them to glorify God. Well, let's close. As we come to the end of this chapter, I would just point out some Christians, I would, I would argue many Christians, mistakenly believe that these bodies are not very important. After all, they're just earthen vessels. They're just clay pots that our souls live in. They're just tents in which we travel throughout life and at the end of our days the tents will be folded up and discarded it's true. The Bible does use the metaphors of clay pots and earthen vessels and tents to describe our bodies. But in those particular passages, those metaphors are being used in that way to make a, a, a larger point. But we learn in this passage that our bodies are really a lot more than that. They're much more than just temporal creations that are going to just you know, be done away with and, and, and cease to exist and that's it. No. No. In today's passage, we've highlighted several important truths about our physical bodies. And I want to close by just recapping them real quick. There's six of them. Number one, our bodies. Now, this was in the, the psalm, not in this text, but I want to point it out because it's important. Our bodies are fearfully and wonderfully made. They're not an afterthought. They're not something that God just threw together. All of us, each and every one of us, have been lovingly crafted by the creator of the universe. He has fashioned us and formed us and made us beautifully unique from one another by design and by intentionality. Beloved, 
We're not to be puffed up. We're not to be arrogant. We're not to think so great about ourselves. But still, we can delight in the Lord that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Each one of us is a masterpiece of God. We should view ourselves as such. We should view each other as such. These bodies are not junk. They're not dime store prints. And we should not treat them as like cheap garbage. Yeah. Number two. As Christians, our bodies will be physically raised, glorified, and united with our souls so that we may live with Jesus physically and spiritually as human beings forever and ever and ever. These bodies are made to last. They are not temporary. They are not expendable. Yes, they will be glorified. Yes, they will be made incorruptible. But I'm still going to be me. You're still going to be you. Third, our bodies are members of Christ. We are one with him and he with us. He abides in us, we abide in him. When we defile our bodies, listen, when we defile our bodies by joining them with the prostitute, we defile his body also. Because we share in the body. We defile our bodies, we defile his body. Number four. Sexual immorality is a sin against one's own body. In other words, listen, it is self-destructive behavior. We need not inflict harm upon ourselves by engaging in sexually immoral conduct. Number five, Christians are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He abides in us. Our bodies are the temple of the Spirit of God. And as such, we should strive to keep them pure and holy. Number six. In truth, our bodies don't belong to us. They belong to Jesus. And as such, they should be used in accordance with his will and his purposes because they belong to him. Yeah. And so for all of these reasons that Paul has so masterfully laid out here in this passage, we should flee from sexual immorality yeah. in all of its forms, and that's a lot, yeah. because as we said last week, sexual immorality Biblically speaking, includes any conduct, any sexual expression outside of the parameters of biblical marriage. And that's a broad spectrum. We should flee from it because it's a sin against God. And instead, we should use our bodies to glorify the Lord. Therefore, Glorify God with your bodies. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this opportunity to open your word. Lord, it's amazing how your word is so relevant. How it speaks to issues that are contemporary, even in modern times. It's just an affirmation that we don't change. Oh, the technology may change. The media and the means of transportation and so forth may change. The clothing may change. The hairstyles may change. But we as people are still the same old sexually immoral people we've always been. And your word still speaks to us just as well and true and accurately as it did 2,000 years ago. God, I pray 
that we would flee from sexual immorality. And be up above and beyond that, that we would use our bodies to glorify you. And that you would be glorified in us and through us and by us. God, help us to view our bodies as you view them. And thank you, God, for creating us as you have. Lord, I pray if there's any decisions to be made, whatever they might be this morning, I pray that they'd be made during this brief opportunity to respond. For we ask it in Jesus' name.